Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Priscilla Wadham and I'm Manager of Alumni Relations uh, here at the Australian National University. I'd like to welcome you this evening to our inaugural ANU alumni-sponsored research series public lecture. This is the first in what we hope will be a, a long series of lectures aimed to showcase current and major research achievements from the Australian National University. The series will be hosted by the Alumni Relations Office and will feature researchers from disciplines across the university. Before introducing our guest speaker this evening, may I take this opportunity to acknowledge the first Australians on whose land we meet, whose cultures, which are amongst the oldest continuing cultures in human history, we celebrate. This evening's lecture, Target Earth, the Asteroid Impact History of Australia, will be delivered by Dr Andrew Glickson, visiting fellow in the ANU School of Archaeology and Anthropology, Planetary Science Institute and Climate Change Institute. By way of background, Dr Glickson graduated from the University of Western Australia and has held positions as a principal research scientist at Geoscience Australia. He has conducted extensive geological surveys in outback Australia, specialised in studies of the early Earth, the effects of asteroids and comets on terrestrial evolution, and the origin of mass extinction of species. Most recently, Dr Glickson has been studying the effects of climate on human evolution. Please join me in welcoming Dr Glickson, whom I understand will take questions at the conclusion of his talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Priscilla, and I really appreciate the invitation by the alumni office and the help uh, of Francis in this regard. I was always accused that my science is too poetic and my poetry is too scientific. So in this talk, I'll try and find a middle way between a presentation of the evidence and perhaps some comments about the saga of the evolution of the Earth to this stage. Now, since humans appeared on the planet, they were caught between fires, sky fires, uh, represented by the stars and by falling comets and terrestrial fires, like volcanoes and lightnings, until they mastered it. And as they say, the rest is history. Comets had a particularly strong effect on humans. We now estimate that comets on the side of Tunguska, which is shown in this diagram, have hit Earth about every two or three hundred years. Uh, and comets, because they're small and they consist largely of uh, ice and gas and some silicates, explode. They form fireworks in the sky. And ancient humans, prehistoric humans, have seen them time and time again, thousands of times, uh, interpreting them in terms of the arrival of the gods or punishment from heaven. Tunguska is the best example we know about. It occurred in Siberia in 1918. Humans have observed it from the distance. Uh, when they arrived at the site, the trees were flattened, as you can see in this picture on the left. And it's now considered Tunguska was formed by a comet, small comet, maybe 50 meters, which exploded kilometers high in the atmosphere. We still find iridium on the ground. Now, but if comets have left an indelible effect or impression on the human mind, large asteroids left an impression on the Earth as a whole. In fact, I will be presenting evidence in, later on in this talk showing that asteroids of dimensions on the scale of several tens of kilometers forming uh, craters, original uh, uh, impact basins on a scale of several hundred kilometers 
have impacted on the Earth time and again, and that they occurred in clusters. And I will indicate also why, until recently, the evidence for this impact has been obscure. There are reasons for it. Nature knows how to hide her secret. But the human mind developed to the extent that we don't even have to wait for the asteroid to arrive here. Not that it's very likely in our time. But we are now reaching them. Like the Rosetta um, spaceship uh, has uh, now encountered recently Lutetia, that's the European Space Agency, the um, asteroid Lutetia, 134 kilometer. And is probing it, uh, sending missiles into it, and studying it in some detail. Now, why is there life on Earth, and possibly only primitive life on the other planet? Well, there are many reasons, and the essential ones are not known. However, one factor involved in the emergence and preservation of life on the Earth is Jupiter. Jupiter the planet, or Jupiter the god, which sweeps up the great bulk majority of asteroids from the asteroid belt, which includes some two million uh, asteroid rocks, between Mars and Jupiter. Most of them fall into Jupiter, as we have seen in 1994. It's a Shoemaker-Levi cluster of 21 comets. And um, as we can see on Mars, which is more heavily bombarded than the Earth, being closer to Jupiter. Now, I could go on and sort of tell some Hollywood stories, uh, asteroids, um, and dinosaurs really excited the imagination of uh, children and all the children worldwide. And it's very easy to try and blow it up in the sense of this image which you're looking at, but I prefer not to do that. Instead, I'm going to give you a, a long and boring list of <laughs> a summary of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, now, as I said, the asteroid impact of the Earth has been largely masked. Two factors, one, the difficulty in detecting buried craters and impact ejector units, and second, the fact that impact science falls between Earth science, which looks into the Earth, and traditionally in universities, in geological course, we learn about the Earth and the interior of the Earth. Asteroid or comet impacts are considered to be mere little holes, accidental holes in the ground, that's all. Well, I, I will try and show that this is not exactly so. So, uh, in between air science and between astronomy, and astronomy is mostly looking further into space. So, it's now known, the mention, as I mentioned, that the Earth has been bombarded by several asteroid clusters, uh, including the late heavy bombardment, about which we know very little on the Earth, but we have a lot of information on the Moon. Because the moon and the earth were juxtaposed, were linked. Uh, it's a safe assumption the earth has been affected. And after that, we have clusters. And typically, they are clusters. They don't fall in singles. They fall in two, three, four, or more. And we don't find all of them, but we find some. So we had clusters at 3.47 billion years ago, 3.26, 3.24 billion years ago, 2.63, 256, 248, 202, 185. 350 million, 250 million, and so on all the way. The last big cluster was 0.35 million years ago, and I'll be talking about it in a moment. Now, what is the incidence or the frequency of impact of asteroid on the Earth? Part of it we know from the actual evidence we find in the ground in forms of crater of ejecta. But we can also have an idea about the frequency of impact from the moon. Why? Because the moon sits there like a mirror. So, um, I will talk about it in a moment. Based on the uh, projections from the lunar impact history, we infer there were some 15 to 25 Eros size, Eros scale asteroids which affected the Earth. Eros was 33 kilometers. And each one of them has ended up with a major cataclysm. We can't identify all of them, but we can identify one with great uh, precision, I'd say, I would suggest and other ones rather by circumstantial evidence, possibly. Forming craters larger than 300 kilometers. And because these craters have excavated the crust deep to the base of the crust and are so large, we actually find almost 50% of the very large impact craters of fallout ejecta preserved on the Earth. 
just a high percent. We find a very small percent of the larger ones. Where there is a major coastal event, transformation, from oceanic crust to continental crust, which occurred at 3.26, 3.24. It's one which uh, we studied in the Pilbara and in South Africa. Uh, connections between impacts and between archaean life are expressed by association between impact fallout units and overlying banded iron formations, insofar as banded iron formations are considered by many workers to represent early life, with iron metabolizing bacteria. So, and the last but not the least, during the last 350 million years or so, uh, there were several mass extinction events which coincide with large uh, impact events and large and volcanic uh, eruptions, including late Devonian, Permian, Triassic, Boundary, late Triassic, late Jurassic, and KT Boundary, that you see. Now, juxtaposition is time, in time is not proof of cause-effect relationship. It's not a proof. We need much more evidence to establish a connection between whether it's asteroids and volcanoes and mass extinction. But several such connections now have been observed, and I will talk about them. Now, this talk was invited following the discovery uh, late last year of a large impact structure under the Timor Sea. Here is a, um, a satellite image of the Timor Sea and the orange cir circle just south, 50 kilometers south of Ashmore Reef is an area where drilling has discovered a large seismic dome structural dome discovered by seismic means. Here is a dome. You can see it at the bottom right. You can see it at the top left, the expression of the stratigraphy. And you can see that the dome is being truncated by an unconformity of younger formations. This is a late Eocene, 34 million years old, central uplift of a large impact structure. This crater itself could be larger than 100 kilometers. It's interesting because of more than one reason. Uh, here is some of the evidence for the impact. On the left top, you see some of the uh, pseudotacillate, we call it, finely comminuted crushed material. Here is crushed quartz. Here is the microbrexia. And here's some fracturing quartz. The particular interest in this, uh, in the TMOC, or Ashmore, Mount Ashmore structure, is that it coincides in time very closely with two other large impacts. One is Poppy Guy in Siberia, the other one called um, Chesapeake Bay in, off Virginia coast. All of the same age, all at the late Eocene, all at the time that the Antarctic ice sheet started to form. There is the climate connotation here. The connotation is that this large uh, cluster of asteroids could have triggered the split of the Drake Passage between West Antarctic and South America. This allowed the establishment of the circum-Antarctic cold current, which isolated the continent from tropical, warm tropical currents. And here is the, the sharp drop of the late Eocene of five degrees Celsius. And a theory is, it's far from proven, is that the um, albedo enhancement, the aerosol uh, dusting uh, released by this asteroid cluster, enhanced uh, in a, a cooling trend. There was already a cooling trend then. It enhanced it, and it resulted in the present glacier interglacial period following that. No proof, just a possibility. That's how we work. We form working hypotheses, and some of them get um, established with further evidence, some don't. Here are the other craters, the Chesapeake Bay, and that's Poppy Guy, 100 kilometer, 85 kilometer. Well, what do I do now? I will press on help. Thank you. Who knows this one, isn't it? 
This one. Yep, that's the one. Well, help does help, doesn't it? <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, we're looking here at the um, parameters, which is the frequency distribution, the explosive power, and the diameter of asteroids, all the way from um, the very small ones, which are talked about, Tunguska, the comet, all the way to the KT boundary one represented uh, by the Chicxulub crater, 170 kilometers in Mexico. And this diagram uh, shows you uh, the number of near-Earth asteroids and here on the left axis, uh, the impact incidence here in terms of years, impact energy, megaton TNT, and asteroid diameter. Just comes to show the complete range we have in size and characteristics. I was talking about projections of uh, impact frequency from the moon. And here, we're looking at the lunar curve, that's uh, the cumulative number of craters of certain diameter, diameter C, against crater diameter in kilometers. This is a lunar curve. We project it to the Earth in terms of the size of the Earth's surface, and then we make assumption on the distribution of the oceans and the continents at the oceans. And based on these estimates, we arrive uh, here is a table, and the important numbers to look at here is the number I mentioned before, 15 to 25, impact uh, or error size, where the craters are larger than 300 kilometers, and two to four even bigger ones. Here's a picture of some of the biggest uh, uh, craters and the oldest ones preserved on the Earth. On the top left, you're looking at Riedefort, uh, 287 kilometers in South Africa. It's a huge dome preserved there with the granite core embasement at the center. That's the uh, Riedefort, that, that's a magnetic picture of Riedefort, showing the volcanics at the rim. This is Sudbury, the famous Sudbury, which is 200 in Ontario, 250 kilometers. That's a radar image, and that's a digital elevation model image. Now, I was talking about this great difficulty in detecting uh, the impact history of the Earth, and these difficulties are now represented in this diagram. It shows craters, impact basins, which formed in the oceans, they get the ocean crust is subducted. So these craters, even though they preserved back to about 200 million years, which is the life of the present ocean crust, as far as it goes, they are being subducted and destroyed. The evidence is gone. And since in the past we had, with uh, most geochemists and other top geologists believe, larger uh, ratio of ocean to continent, the great majority of craters have been destroyed by the um, deformation of oceanic crust. Craters um, which formed in mountainous regions get clearly eroded away. The craters which we do find are those preserved in stable cartonic basins where they are covered by sediments but still exist. And Australia is ideal in this regard because Australia is such a stable continent. Here are a few examples of uh, impact structures discovered in Australia. We discovered Woodley, which is the fifth largest in the world. It's 120 kilometers large in the Carnarvon Basin, Western Australia. Here is a central dome, but the structure, um, the ring, uh, extends to 120 kilometers, intersecting all the structural ridges, which I'll show you as soon as my arrow comes. So here are the, all the ridges. Intersected. Same as the Chicxulub impact structure in Mexico, the KT uh, boundary dinosaur killer, all the ridge intersected by the, um, by the impact. Now we're looking at Ackerman in South Australia. It's considered to be 30 kilometers by some and 90 kilometers by others. Here's a magnetic signature around it because the center of the crater of the impact structure can be demagnetized. And here are seismic sections of the Ries crater in Germany and of Woodley which show how at the margin of the crater there is a normal faulting towards the center of the crater where the strata collapse inwards, but at the center there is a rebound, central uplift due to compression, very much like a drop of water 
coming up when you throw a pebble. The crust rebounds elastically and comes up. Another way in which we identify uh, impact structure, and that's a needle in a haystack uh, story. That's one reason why to, to date we only find a few, but there are bound to be more. Uh, criteria which we're looking for are shock metamorphic, uh, planar deformation lamella due to shock metamorphism of quartz. Here's an example. This type of intracrystalline uh, planar textures in quartz is unique. Anyone who finds it under the microscope has found uh, an impact structure, and probably a large one, because they don't form due to normal terrestrial deformation. Another criteria is the occurrence of glass within uh, the host rock. Here are layers of, uh, uh, we don't know that they're glass because they get recrystallized with time, so they are no glass any longer, but we infer that some of this could have been glass originally, and when you get a large amount of glass within host rock, like sediments of granite, likely you might have come across an impact, but you have to have further evidence. Excellent evidence for fallout ejecta from very large impacts are this spheril, <coughs> impact spherules, what we call the microcrystites. These are the condensates, little drop melt condensates, uh, which fall from vapor ejected by large impacts. The crater is fragmented. Much of the material around the exploding bolide is molten uh, and vaporized. The vapor uh, is blown by the winds and then settles like this little crystal. Why do we think they are of impact origin? Because they are rich in iridium and other platinum group elements. They have unique chromium isotope uh, ratios, 50 to 53, and they have other extraterrestrial geochemical signatures. So in Australia to date, we have 35 confirmed impact structure from small ones, a few tens of meters, to Woodley, 120, and 22 possible ones. There are two new ones now, which, uh, uh, which have emerged and still studying them. The two new ones, the evidence is they have shock metamorphic codes, and that's an initial highly confident indication. The rest is hard work to try and find up the structure or structural circumstance uh, in the region of the drill core where such uh, planar deformation lamellas have been found. I will not talk, how much time do I have? I'll now go through uh, examples of um, uh, impact features, impact structures, impact ejecta, the impact history uh, of the early years. Uh, Australia is particularly fortunate in having uh, good art crops of rocks from 3.6 billion years ago uh, to about 2.7 in Western Australia. And that's where a lot of my work has been uh, done. And these impacts are of particular interest because it can tell us something about the early history of the Earth, about which we know less than what we know about more recent periods. So here is the Pilbara looking from a satellite. Here are the big granites and the volcanoes. Uh, much of these um, um, volcanic belts, we call them greenstone belts, consist of pillowed basalt, that's a volcanic lava flowing into water, it globulates and forms these pillows. Here's an example, here's an example, bubbling outwards. Here are uh, agglomerates, fragmental pyroclastics uh, of uh, silica-rich volcanics uh, containing blocks of jasper. And here is chert, which uh, contains very fine-grained uh, pyroclastic tuff. And in between uh, these volcanic sequences, we find the ejecta fallout layers of, of impact, apparently very large impact. This is in an area called North Pole because one day the temperature decreased below 45 degrees, so they call it North Pole. <laughs> <laughs> and there are three ejecta units here on top, and here is one of them. You can see the little spherules, the microcrystals, within a chert uh, uh, fragment, and you can see other ones outside the chert, so there are more than one generation of impacts. And here is a tsunami. Now, the way we find this ejector unit is not by seeing this millimeter size uh, microspheres. My eyes are just not good enough. I stand in front of these art groups. The spheres are there, and I cannot see them. Uh, it, these are obviously under the microscope. But you can see the agglomerate, 
uh, of the, uh, the turbidite, sorry, uh, the tsunami deposits, which occur quite often above the impact fallout unit. It makes sense. Impact causes seismic disturbance, earthquakes, and this causes fragmentation of rocks and so on. Above this, we find jasper very often, and I'll talk about it in a moment. We find iron enrichment in six cases, which is basically all the cases we have in the Pilbara. We find enrichment in iron oxide immediately above the fallout units. We find traces of early life in between the volcanic sequences. Here are the famous stomatolites, 3.42 billion years ago, several art crops, as you can see. I will not uh, talk too long about this because um, I will be running out of time. Uh, here are uh, large, what we call olistostroms, which are fragmented rocks breccia with blocks up to 250 meters large of fault escarpment, which occurred at the time that large impacts have uh, occurred in South Africa, but South Africa and Western Australia could have been quite close. So here are uh, the results, likely results, of some of this, this impact cluster, the 3.26, 3.24, and again, bended down formation on top, typical. Here is a section showing it up, the um, broken rocks, the storms, the bended down formations, and the impact unit will be here when we find it. That's a model which tries to um, explain how this uh, 3.26 impact occurred. Uh, the impact occurred in oceanic regions. We know it because the ejector is rich in magnesium and iron. Uh, there will have had, had to be convection cell developing below uh, such a large impact. And what we find in the nuclei, the continental nuclei, which occurred at that time, we find in magmatic activity, we find the formation of unconformities, and we find the impact fallout horizon the microcrystals. I not talk about it, we not talk about this very much because this attempts to correlate uh, tectonic events through time with impact events. There is a, only a very partial correlation. It's another impact uh, unit, 2.63 billion years ago, uh, which occurs at this position. Again, bended down formation on top. Here are the tsunami deposits, and here is a micro crystal. And here too. That's um, another tsunami deposit, the deformation uh, of the seafloor below a large impact of 2.63 in the East Bilbao, and here is a micro crystal. A very large stomatolite, the largest one we've ever seen, several tenths of meters, intercalated above this impact horizon. Uh, possibly the last one, before the last, I will show you in the sequence, 2.56 uh, microcrystals and tsunami, uh, the tsunami deposit, or rather the arrival of the tsunami wave shown by this cross bed in here. The impact unit is just down here. This is the same one showing on a larger scale. The impact fallout unit here, a seismic zone of turbidites here, the tsunami arrival in a cross wave on top. Uh, evidence, geochemical evidence that we are looking at extraterrestrial uh, geochemical signatures comes up from relation with, between palladium and iridium. Uh, you can see that the impact units have higher iridium and have lower, um, uh, higher iridium palladium ratios and higher absolute iridium levels as composed, as opposed to volcanic, uh, volcanic rocks which fall up here in the black signs. Uh, the way we try and infer the size of the asteroids is uh, we do mass balance calculation based on the platinum group elements, iridium and uh, other elements and we plot it, we calibrate it with younger impacts, and this tells us that the ancient impacts were several tens of kilometers in size. Another way is to look at the size of spheres, the distribution, which gives you an idea about the aerodynamics of this system. Okay, I'll try to get quickly through that because I want to come to subjects which are perhaps more relevant uh, here. Uh, what are the consequences of large asteroid impacts? Well, it's really all hell breaking loose. I'm afraid you get atmospheric flash, surface incineration, fires, you get penetration explosion, you get seismic mega earthquake, 
the catering, crustal rebound, fragmental fragmentation, fusion, vaporization of rocks, ejector blankets, atmospheric and stratospheric dusting and vapor clouding, atmospheric chemical reactions, acid rain, ozone destruction, greenhouse effect extinctions, deep crustal fault and volcanic consequences, maybe. What are the implications? Perhaps, perhaps for us. Now, all these effects that I showed you just before are transient and local effects, regional and short-lived. Whether it's fires, whether it's tsunami waves, they come and go. And the biota, the species, um, many are extinguished, but many find havens. Many find shelters in remote areas or underground or in, in deep oceanic basins. Perhaps the more serious or long-lasting effect of such impacts, but also of volcanic events, uh, is the increase, the rising greenhouse level of the atmosphere and the acidification of the oceans. Why? Because while all the previous effects occur over time scales of years or tens of years, maybe hundreds of years, uh, carbon dioxide uh, last in the atmosphere is well mixed and lasts in the atmosphere for thousands to tens of thousands of years. Uh, when feedback occurs from the increased temperature, the effect of carbon dioxide can last for millions of years. Well, in this particular diagram from events which occurred 55 million years ago, Zakos and other ones estimated the longevity of carbon dioxide level at, uh, well, it's just under 10,000 years. This has implications implication to the present, to the release of carbon dioxide on levels which are now getting close to some levels which were reached during previous mass extinctions. Here is a diagram which shows by Keller, which shows, um, uh, portrays the major mass extinctions uh, through, Earth, through the Phanerozoic, through the last uh, 600 million years of Earth's history. This is the uh, extinction intensity and percent, and here you're looking up at several extinctions. This is at 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs and ammonites and many other species uh, disappeared. That's at the end Jurassic. That's at the Permian Triassic boundary. You see it gets up to just under 80% and Devonian and so on. Each one of them a sudden, a relatively sudden uh, event which uh, caused environmental changes um, or, or in, in every way that we look at it, whether it's uh, uh, greenhouse effects, whether it's acidifications, uh, global temperatures following up. There was not very much ice on the Earth during this period, so we can correlate it directly with the glacial interglacial periods. I uh, will portray a couple of these events. You have seen a picture of Woodley, 120 kilometers before. Now, this is the uh, Fitzroy Devonian Reef, which have been uh, killed uh, in a very quick succession at about the time the end Devonian as this impact has occurred. And here's a picture of the reefs here along Fitzroy River and of one of the gogo fauna of fish. Another event, a cluster of asteroids occurred at 145 million years ago. That's Gosses Bluff in Central Australia. It's 24 kilometers, and here it is from an airplane, a very large impact structure uh, in South Africa. Mrokwang, larger than 90 kilometers, occurred at the very same time, and a number of other ones. Again, the end Jurassic is a period of mass extinction. The Katy boundary is the classic mass extinction. Uh, more work has been done on this event 65 million years ago than any other impact. And a lot is known, basically thousands of peer-reviewed uh, papers. Uh, carbon dioxide level rose from about 350, 500 to 2300 parts per million. It's getting towards just order of magnitude. Due to its estimated by people like Berner and others, they are released from sediments, from carbonates and from carbon-rich shells of some 4,000 gigaton of carbon. We have released about one-tenth of it so far. Increase in atmospheric temperature of 12 watt per square meters, and several degrees, uh, 7.5 degrees C. 
So we're coming to the present now, and people very often ask the question, what is the risk to civilization? Well, this diagram shows you the diameter of asteroids. Obviously, the larger the asteroid, the more dangerous the impact, and the probability, increased probability of impact, which means we have several groupings here. It's large impacts, but low probability of impact. We have smaller uh, impacts, but a somewhat larger probability. And the further we go up with the arrow, the larger the size and the higher the probability. So we just hope that this will not happen. But the probability that it will happen any time within the lifespan of the civilization is minute. In this diagram, we're looking at the asteroid size in meters going this way and we're looking at the proximity to the Earth in terms of lunar distances. And there is, there was, and still is, a dangerous one called Tortadis sitting here. It's large, it's a two and a half kilometer large. It has already passed uh, at about only five lunar distances from the Earth. This is very close and is due to pass again at similar distances in about 600 years. So now uh, we can look at these uh, monsters from satellite close by. Here we're looking at Totatis, we're looking at a potential foe. It's been suggested it should be painted on one side, spray painted, so that this will change the rotation and thereby the trajectory. 4.6 by 2.4, this is serious stuff. Anything like that will result in seismic activity that will <coughs> flatten out cities all over, as well as a whole range of other effects. 2,562, probability of only a couple of percent impact. But it's uncertain because its shape is so irregular, it's hard to calculate how close it will be. Another effect of impact will be the tsunami waves. In here, in this diagram, we're looking at an uh, asteroid 200 meters large, uh, impacting in the Pacific, and we're looking at, at the arrival of the tsunami in different destinations, Japan, Taiwan, Shanghai, Hawaii, and so on. The effect will be related to the ratio between the, what we call the run-up factor uh, of the top of the tsunami wave as it encroaches on the continental shelf and the normal sea level. So the higher the GH, the higher the wave. You can see waves can range all the way from 16, 14 or so on, all the way to 59 meters, which is quite serious. Here is El Tanin, a major uh, uh, an impact 2015 million years ago, that's not far ago, far before our time. Human already existed on the planet, and um, the um, tsunami effects have affected, are shown here, they affected Antarctic. We found a tsunami deposit, <coughs> excuse me, in dry valleys of the Antarctic. What is the risk? <coughs> well, these are probability of fatality for individuals. That's log number of uh, people killed per event. So these are the massive events, uh, large scale events in terms of large populations or regions. This is the risk per individual. You can see the risk per individual, for example, uh, for a car accident is, is high. Uh, but for fast road impact, risk for individual is low, it's about one to 10,000. However, if an impact occurs, it will affect many more people, 10 to the power of eight, hundreds of thousands of people. And I will not say anything about this factor. So to summarize now, leave time for questions, is the early history of the Earth's moon system was marked by several major cataclysms, a cataclysmic impact episodes at 385, 395 billion years ago, and 326, 324 billion years ago. Large asteroids and comet impacts triggered major igneous and tectonic episodes affecting the evolution of continents and onset of plate tectonic cycles. In several instances, impacts by asteroids and comets resulted in mass extinctions 359 million years ago, which is late Devonian, late Triassic, late Jurassic, Katy boundary, and Eocene 34 million years ago. They released by impact of carbon dioxide, a well-mixed gas of residence time on the scale of 10 to 4 to 10 to 5 years, 
constituted a major factor in long-term climate changes, mass extinction of species. And asteroids continue to pose kind hazard to advanced forms of life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Glickson. We, we have about um, 10 minutes or so for questions. So are there, are there um, things that you'd like to ask Dr. Glickson as he's here? Anyone question up the back? If you just hang on a tick, we've got a roving mic coming your way. Thank you. Dr. Gleason, I was just wondering if in your studies you, you found that certain forms of life proliferate or, or benefit from uh, a massive Earth impact. Yes, definitely. We wouldn't be here if it wouldn't have been for the impact uh, 60... We, we wouldn't be here if it was not for the impact 65 million years ago, which has eliminated the dinosaurs, but allowed uh, the small mammals, the marsupials and other mammals, the burrowing ones, to emerge on the continents in bigger size and larger numbers. Uh, had the, this impact not occurred and dinosaurs still roamed, the continent and ocean, uh, not very likely mammals like us would have actually survived. But that's only one example. But you get radiation, every extinction is followed by radiation of species. And this species obviously benefit in inverted commas from the fact that uh, new niches, ecological niches, open up and are vacated. Andrew, you mentioned earlier in your talk that Mars may have had higher impact rate. I'm over here. A higher impact rate than the Earth. How do you know that? Is, is it just we have lost the evidence from the Earth from geologic activity? Or how do you know Mars had a higher impact rate? Because I think the simulations don't show that. Well, when, when you look at uh, ancient surfaces on Mars, and they are not dated with any accuracy, but they considered ancient, uh, you find a much larger uh, proportion in size and frequency of impact than you find, ever find on the Earth. Of course, on the Earth they keep on being destroyed, but Mars is also quite an active planet. Uh, there are stable regions where you do find this high frequency of craters, but there are also active regions in which you find almost none. So I'd say it's not known with any precision because the ages, the isotopic ages of these surfaces and of this impact, the absolute ages, have not been determined. So I should have added, so is that, it's, that one can infer that Mars is more heavily bombarded, but really people need to get samples from there, etc., etc., to establish this, this observation. Uh, do you believe that um, plate tectonics were actually initiated by impacts? Well, not the mechanism of plate tectonic is inherent in the convection of the mantle. So plate tectonics would have occurred anyway, but the precise location of the breakup of continents and the rifting and the timing of this breakup is likely, I'm saying likely, there is, it's not proven to have been affected by large impact, large impact clusters. When you compare the, when you look at the age of the major rifting of the Syrian African rift right through um, Middle Eastern Africa, started about the end Jurassic, and when you look at the split of the Atlantic Ocean about the end Triassic, and when you look at the Drake Passage, which I talked about before, a number of other ones, there is a broad age coincidence, but this is no evidence. That's just a working hypothesis, and which might actually never be proven. So plate tectonic is inherent in the processes of the mantle earth, but the timing and the triggering and the location of particular splits and the emergence or rather the reactivation of particular cells might have very well been at times affected by large impacts, yes. I was just wondering if um, an asteroid was quite a large one, um, would it have 
effect, um, I'm over here, sorry. Um, would it affect, um, uh, would the whole earth feel it, or would it be more localised? And, and if it was a large one, would it affect the orbit of the earth? I was just thinking if uh, an asteroid hit the moon, I just think of the consequences of um, the moon, the lack of the moon on earth because of our tides and everything else. I mean, just the impact of an asteroid hitting earth or the moon. Does it affect orbit or whatever? Well, in principle, yes. Like, uh, if people do calculations, they have been done. The tilt of the axis and the precession of the axis and other parameters would be affected by large impact and large asteroids. But there is no way we can measure it in the geological record. Well, you, you can me measure magnetic striping and magne paleomagnetic orientations, but whether the precision will allow you to pick up this fraction of a degree to which the Earth uh, axis has been affected, uh, pro probably not. The errors are too big. So in principle, yes, but in practice, we cannot detect it. a bit of a weird question, but if that, um, that giant impactor in 600 years' time does hit Earth, do you think it would be big enough to make another moon? <laughs> well, it's actually quite a pertinent question because the idea, the way the moon was formed, is that uh, very early in the history of the Earth, the Earth was still molten. Another planet, about the scale of Mars, hit Earth and the ejector has finally uh, coagulated rather um, to form the moon. So for one thing, the Earth was molten then. For the other thing, you need an uh, asteroid or planet to the size of Mars. Uh, the Earth now is, uh, of course, much more solid, and we have no evidence that any such body is approaching Earth at all. So. Thank you. Um, you mentioned, Dr. Glickson, that the uh, KT ex extinction was clearly related from the evidence to an extraterrestrial uh, impact. I wasn't clear what your conclusion was about the N Permian extinction, the very large one. You mentioned that both extraterrestrial impacts and volcanic activity can contribute. What was the conclusion about the N Permian extinction in terms of the main source? Yeah, that's a very good question. For a very long time, was considered that, sorry, for a very long time, it was considered that it's a Norilsk basalt, a large volume of plateau basalt erupted in Siberia, which has um, emanated, emitted such amounts of aerosols and carbon dioxide, was the cause of acidifying the ocean, causing anoxia, anoxia in the ocean, uh, sulfate rich, sulfur rich, uh, H2S rich, uh, volatiles emanating from the ocean. That's Peter Ward's book, uh, under green sky, uh, when, when life almost disappeared, okay, when life almost snuffed up. So this is the dominant idea. However, there's also uh, an impact structure called Araguina in Brazil, which is 40 kilometer large. It's not large enough to cause too much mischief, but it hits carbonates and carbon-rich shells. And when this happens, large volumes of uh, volatiles, including CO2 and methane water, emanated. Uh, so this would have been a contributing factor. The age overlap, but once again, age overlap is no evidence of cause and effect, but makes it likely. I'd say both factors exi existed. And this leads me, your question leads me to another point. Every time, about, almost every time, the world's an impact cluster, we also see large-scale large volcanism on the Earth. And a theory has been suggested by people that this volcanism was triggered by the impact. Or volcanism already existed there, like in India, before it has been rejuvenated or, um, by the impact. And this is possible. This is possible. There is a broad coincidence. And once again, a lot of work has been to be done to, in order to prove anything. So the cascading effect one causing another. Well, the impact causes faulting, and the faulting, if it's deep enough, can affect the sources of magma, either locally or if the impacts are spread enough or large enough, even at a distance. Any other questions?
questions? There's one there. Yeah. You mentioned something about Jupiter, um, that it had an effect on saving the Earth or protecting the Earth in some way. Could you just elaborate on that, please? Yes, well, the, the mass of Jupiter is 284 times, I think, that of the Earth. Uh, the asteroid belt from which the asteroid arrived, not the comets, comets arrived from the rim, the outer margin of the solar system, but the asteroid arrived due to internal collision within the asteroid belt, there's some two million of them, between Mars and Jupiter. But due to the enormous gravity of Jupiter, they fall in to Jupiter, then some fall out. If Jupiter did not exist there, many more would have fallen out. Earth would have been bombarded to the extent that life would have been under stress, to say the least. <laughs> uh, I think there would have still been bacteria living several kilometers deep in the air in fractures. But as to the surface, that's a different story. <laughs> had changed in the rocks that were at the actual site of the impact and said they were like tsunami affected. Um, how does the tsunami work? I, I thought it had to create some sort of force that pushed water. Is it water out like you would when a stone drops into a stream and you see all the circles like rippling out? Um, where are these rock formations that show tsunami effects? Well, if the impact lands in the oceans or even shallow seas, you get the tsunami waves emanating from the site itself. But because impacts cause a uh, major seismic activity, regionally or even worldwide, the seismicity in remote areas will in itself cause disturbance. An earthquake can trigger tsunami in their own right. And if you're asking what does it look like, well, there were a number of uh, pictures which actually showed tsunami. Uh, well, one here, within this section, it's actually quite amazing because the whole section formed within no longer than one or two hours. Well, how do we know it? We know it because just under the Swiss knife, this white horizon here is formed of these little melt spherules, the microcrystites. That's the uh, high temperature uh, condensates from ejected vapor from the original site. So this lands first. Then we get the turbidites from seismic disturbance. Then we get the waves. This is a wave, this is a ripple. This is caused by a wave which has reached the ocean, the ocean bottom or the sea bottom. And so this is one expression. And this all happens because the tsunami could not arrive much later than one or two hours after the impact, unlikely. This means that the whole section, sorry, I should point out this, the whole section form within a couple of hours. And uh, other form of the tsunamis are, are, are the Brexias. Here, here you get the bottom of the sea, probably not very deep, a few hundred meters, which consists of limestones. And the limestone had been totally shattered. You can see all the bits and pieces. And some of these shattered veins, you get veins like this, here and here, contain microspherules. How did they arrive there? You need enormous hydraulic pressure from the tsunami wave which arrived in this site to induce injection of this uh, microcrystal, of this melt uh, droplets into the rock. So this tells us something about the magnitude scale of the wave and of the pressure associated with it. Uh, so therefore, these relate to underwater 
um, activity. Like it, it is not above land. It was not above water, these areas which were affected by the um, asteroid impact where the crater is. All of it happened underwater. Is that right? No. No. Uh, it's only that what above land was eroded and is not preserved. But uh, a lot of what we're looking at would have happened under shallow water or even above sea level. For example, this uh, mega breccia, uh, Polistostrom, this one, you're looking here at blocks which are up to, the larger one is 250 meter large. This is enormous. We don't see blocks of this size normally in volcanic terrains. And there are major faults bordering them. So the inference is that seismic activity created these faults and the collapse of these faults into these huge blocks has been related to these movements. So that's also another effect. Effects occur on a complete range of scales, all the way from these little waves which I showed just before, two blocks of this size. Okay, I think we've got time for one more. Yeah, one more. Thank you. Is it possible that a, a large impact can eject terrestrial material back into space? Yes, it is possible, yes. Escape velocity of vapor, for example, ejected from a large impact would send um, hydrogen. I mean, it would dissociate once it arrives um, at the edge of the atmosphere uh, due to the solar wind and so on, water will dissociate into hydrogen, oxygen, but the escape velocity from large impact would send it out, yeah. I think that's all we've got time for, and I think uh, Dr. Glickson will be with us for a little bit longer this evening um, to answer any individual questions you may have. This draws to the close our formal proceedings. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us tonight. From my point of view, as an arts grad, this was a fascinating uh, journey, and uh, I'd personally like to thank Dr Glickson, but please join me together in, in thanking him. Thank